asked me to talk about was an update on the implications of the pandemic um, for dentistry for people with bleeding disorders and the teams that work with these patients. So, um, you know, that um, providing dental care for people with bleeding disorders is a big networking event. We have three leads um, um, in this area. Um, myself in Dublin at the National Coagulation Centre, Dr. Kirsten Fitzgerald, who is at Crumlin, and um, my colleague, Donnie, uh, Daniel McEwen, who came through our programme at Trinity, who leads services in Cork. We are supported by a big network of dentists around the country, uh, um, um, providing care for people with bleeding disorders. But the thing was that the pandemic has had a huge impact on dental care, principally because um, it's one of the only um, emergency or essential uh, services where people have to take a mask off to be able to have treatment, unlike you know, hairdressing or some of the other therapies, whether it be physio or whatever. The other thing is that the instruments that we use, plus even the breathing in and out, generates these aerosol particles, um, which throw um, um, COVID particles into the air, which stay in the environment and settle up to three hours later on our services. So we had big um, challenges, and certainly for those of us who've had to see COVID patients who have got active, huge, life-threatening dental problems, this meant huge areas of, of PPE. But we were very lucky at the National Coagulation Centre that we'd got a new unit and it was really fit for purpose when we set it up. We'd got HEPA filters, we'd got external um, windows, and for example, so a few um, precautions meant that we could carry on providing care very quickly. For example, we instigated a fogging machine using state-of-the-art sodium hypochlorite. We also um, made sure that anybody having invasive dental treatment that involved an aerosol had rubber dam put over their mouth so that we couldn't throw the particles into the air. One thing we've changed and we followed the evidence to show that the only thing that will reduce the COVID load if someone's in unsymptomatic um, is a use of a povidine iodine gargle. So sorry lads, sorry um, ladies, it tastes revolting, but everybody coming in at the moment is gargling with this because it's evidence-based um, to, 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 to actually really reduce the risk of, um, of transmission. So generally dentistry in Ireland, unlike air areas in the rest of Europe, stayed open. It was deemed an essential service. However, um, the, the services we could offer were relatively limited to try and reduce footfall. Um, to reduce the aerosols that were being pr uh, provided. And because we needed to have this half an hour lockdown really between patients to do an even more um, thorough uh, cleaning of the surgery. This in general practice has had cost implications um, because often this, this cost has been passed on to patients or those with a medical card have been refused care because the HSE hasn't been funding the PPE and the extra time. So this has led to access problems. But we've done well in dentistry despite being the highest risk practitioners of all, of, of all professions during COVID. Myself, my three colleagues, my, our nurses, we have remained COVID free. We have no antibodies and we were the first team in Ireland dental team to be vaccinated. So we're fully vaccinated and very thankful to be in that first wave. It's given us that extra um, level of security, but we've been living like monks. Being a dentist during this, you go home, you can't see anyone because it's a risk procedure. At the moment, temporarily, we have had to reduce footfall in Ireland after the spike um, seen in January. Um, so at the moment in St. James's, we are only being able to provide urgent or emergency care or provide care for people in pain or those whom they're, you know, if we don't provide care, um, we're really gonna see serious deterioration. But we really embraced the teledentistry. In fact, having a system set up 
pre-existing both the red eye that we talked about, the blue eye, the uh, patient portal meant that we've actually won international competitions. My, uh, our fantastic dental nurse, Laura Parkinson, won a clinical research award for our work with teledentistry. We were able to look at evaluating the outcomes, what it meant for patients with teledentistry. So we were ahead of the field because we got that infrastructure. Teledentistry is nothing new, Previously, it's been used mainly for dental tourism, for people going to have major implants in Turkey or 100,000 veneers in um, um, Estonia or whatever. So it's there, but we hadn't used it much within medicine. But we won a big international research award for our teledentistry pretty, pretty quickly um, on. And what did we learn from our study? We learned that dentistry was really important during the pandemic. We learned that people couldn't put up with toothache alongside all the other stressors, whether it be being locked down with their family, um, you know, being short of money, um, you know, having all of the other stresses. Toothache on top of that was unbearable and really impacted on people's quality of life. We learned that despite all the education that we do, people still didn't know how to use pain relief, were scared to use pain relief. Um, and what we actually saw also was that um, for the first time, um, we were actually able to really meaningfully um, arrange care remotely with dentists using telementoring. I'll talk, I'll talk to you about that with patients going to dentists all over the country, but being managed centrally. The other significant thing was that the people who saw us regularly didn't generally have many dental problems. They was, these were a new cohort of people we were seeing, those with mild haemophilia, those people with von Willebrands, with platelet function defects, who perhaps were going to mainstream dentists, but then during the pandemic couldn't get care or their dentist was scared to provide care or really importantly, people had lost jobs, were not able to afford care. And so we're choosing to have extractions rather than root canal. And really finance has been a huge issue for people because dentistry is funded like unlike any other area of medicine. So it meant people couldn't afford what they needed. Um, we had fantastic um, photographs from patients. I'll talk a little bit about that, which really allowed us to assess remotely. Um, but what we um, instigated um, during this was um, quite interesting. Lots and lots of times I have, during the last 15 years, had patients coming in with broken teeth. What we really started to do during the pandemic was for patients as an interim, because with a bleeding disorder, if you've got a sharp edge of a tooth, it can lacerate your tongue, it can cause a hematoma. We were able to tutor people remotely on how to place a temporary filling because you can buy the kits from chemists. So we really did sort of start some, so we started with patient, not only tele assessment, but tele treatment, tele self treatment. Um, so we found that teledentistry had lots of issue um, of possibilities. We could do virtual consultations. We could triage and identify who needed to come urgently who could go locally, who could do a self remedy. We could give really in-depth pain management advice. Um, we could, as I say, we could, we could assess so many areas, but the lesson learned here was that in Ireland, other than paracetamol for dental pain, people were unwilling or scared to go anything higher. And paracetamol just doesn't hack it for dental pain. So whiskey was the number two um, uh, self-treatment, huge amounts of whiskey or gin or whatever. So I, I, I think that the big lesson I'd love to, to, to take away today is that dental pain is an inflammatory pain. So opioids don't really work. So paracetamol is the first line, but it always, almost, almost always needs um, something like a coxia, eteroxicob, as an aside, together with the paracetamol. And the two together work extremely well for toothache. And it's amazing how many people had this at home for their joints, but didn't think of taking it for their toothache. But we found that women with bleeding disorders were consistently scared 
to take anything other than paracetamol. And so um, introducing them to something like Arcoxia was completely new. And then they started saying, could I take this for my period pain thing? So I think that was really interesting. Tramadol is what we'd add as a third line if we couldn't control dental pain. And again, because of Fergal's amazing work with the portal, I was able to check patients' medical histories and remote prescribe and get, um, and get prescriptions out to people who were suffering. This was a great thing and I shall continue this throughout uh, the pandemic. Then there were for the photographers out there. I mean, this is something that I could put in a journal, but taken by a patient only last week who not only sent me a picture of his tooth, notated it, sent me a scale picture of the piece that had come up. I was able to see what this gentleman would need, what sort of injection he needed, could his local dentist do here. This gentleman needs an ID block for this. This means he needs factor, he needs to come to me. Those are the sort of things I could never really assess. It needed an extra visit. And during this pandemic, no one wanted to come twice um, to the center. So the dental photography has been fantastic. But also what I learned was most of the patients who suffered severe pain during the pandemic had an underlying profound dental anxiety. We picked up phobics who hadn't been for years. And I see great potential going forward for the delivery of cognitive behavioral therapy, for reassurance, for people to talk to Laura or one of my colleagues and, and actually get some confidence, but a real proper program. We can also talk through sedation options for them so we can get them in. And I think that most people are scared to come and see a dentist. If you can show some humanity and get some communication coming forward, we've really found some new ways of communicating with people. We've put them in chart in, in Lawrence Woolard, I don't know if he's here, but always asks me, he says, what can we do about dental anxiety? There are some fantastic websites out there. And his comment has always made me now share websites where people can go and read and talk to others and, and do some self preparation at home with their fears. Um, lots of people were fearing how much money, how much um, dentistry would cost them um, at the moment. So, um, so again, that was a big anxiety. But tele-mentoring is the big thing I will take forward out of this. We've always mentored patients, but because all of the dentists around the country have been used to speaking on the phone now, they have really been prepared to work with us where I can talk through a specific treatment plan. Um, and in fact, again, we published um, an algorithm so I can specifically talk both patient and dentist through a specific treatment plan where we can pick out what special measures are needed, what post-operative pain relief. Um, we can actually look at specific patients having specific treatment. This is available on the IHS website and it's also available as a resource pack on the EHC website. And this has really transformed um, networking and mentoring. We've had dentists who never would have dared take teeth out or provide care for people with hemophilia. Um, and, and this has really transformed that, transformed that. So look at our outcomes. Um, uh, last year, we um, did a big review to look at what the national and international bleed rates are for dental extractions in people with uh, bleeding disorders. It ranges from about a 10% bleed rate following a dental extraction to up to 70% in some, in some protocols. Um, so where were we? Um, well, we extracted twice as many teeth uh, last year than we did the year before because of all of the effects of the, uh, the pandemic. Our bleed rate, including extractions done by general practitioners was less than 5%. In fact, up until about four weeks ago, it was 0%. I put that down to careful um, planning, but also our protocol with, at the uh, Haemophilia Center, which is as well as whatever in, um, factor replacement, we have a huge reliance on antifibrolytics, which we have shown is amazing, um, both for handling bleeding, for gum treatment or whatever, but what the three, um, one gram, three times a day, taken, started the day before and continued for five days afterwards, I think has got us with the lowest bleed rate I've ever seen uh, published. Something we're proud of. 
So really, what's the message? The message is we're nearly there and it's time to come back um, soon. I was one of the team that put together, um, I was a dental expert on the WFH guidelines and we spent a lot of time talking about preventive dental care here. Yes, telehealth can actually really support and improve and enhance and empower patients to lead their own care, but patients do need to come and be checked um, at a dentist. Um, um, and generally the rule of thumb, because we really need to pick up, especially in people with haemophilia, problems early. And that takes x-rays and that takes in-depth examinations. And generally we would, you know, say that somebody with a, a serious medical condition would need to see a dentist at least once a year, occasionally once every two years. But we're getting to that time where we need to start thinking about seeing patients. And when you come back, we've been busy. Um, we've been, um, we've all been, uh, you know, very, very um, catching up. I, I've had three jobs. Um, I'm, I've been covering uh, and working with the transplant patients, the cardiac patients, the bone marrow patients, teaching um, our uh, students, and running a, um, you know, quite a big program. But we're very research active, as you know. We're one of the biggest dental research uh, units, probably uh, almost active. Um, we've got a big project coming forward with him, Libra. Uh, we registered a Prospero um, um, systematic review. This is one of my absolutely brilliant uh, postgraduates um, who's leading on this, along with with Laura, myself, and Professor Daly and, and Dr. Neva Connor. We have looked at all of the dental data that has been published on the Haven trials, on the case studies, and we have pulled all that data to see where we are with him Libra and dental surgery. And while we haven't found any, uh, it's looking extremely promising, and it seems that people are going to be able to have all of their fillings, cleanings, whatever, with no substitution, um, the jury's still out. Um, on we've seen bleeds we've seen a lot of documented bleeds with um, with um, him libra and dental extractions but we have no detail as to what was done were those local measures done was the tranic examic acid done so we've got a big consensus study which will be starting next month we're ready for that we've done our review now um, and we will also be developing as part of this study a standardized data set so that we can collect and document all of the outcomes from Heme Libra from all over uh, the world standardized so that we can you know, really accelerate what protocols need to be carried out for people with Heme Libra looking very promising, especially when um, combined with tranexamic acid. Uh, we won another award because we published our protocol for extended half-life factor surgery with Elocta. Um, we did multiple stage um, implant surgery here. And the most important thing about this was that this was done not in the National Centre, externally. So this is multi-stage and we could, you know, we worked personalised. So we're very confident we have a great protocol which uses optimal use of a Elocta um, and very safe surgery, really opening up opportunities for people who've lost teeth. Um, and finally, we were very proud um, to, re to um, present our um, randomized controlled trial on oral health interventions to reduce gum bleeding in women uh, in women and males with von Willebrand's disease, specifically low von Willebrand. Um, we've got a randomized control trial. We now know the behaviors and beliefs um, and have developed an education program for people with bleeding gums that we know works incredibly well. So we can't wait to instigate this when you come back and see us. So it's time to turn on your cameras for questions. My advice to you, we should be open for business, I hope, as soon as St. James's allows us to start bringing back non-urgent. Um, if you need a consultation, um, if you're worried about anything, call the NCC, request a dental teleconsult, and we can take it from there. So um, if you've got an urgent or pressing problem, we are here. Of course, you must never suffer with your teeth. It's unbearable to live with toothache. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alison. Uh, I'm conscious of time, so thank you.